we're in action. Straight to the first slide. So I was going to start with my story, kind of a not too detailed version. So in 2013, I came in with standard blood tests. It's important to stress uh, they were standard. They were not special, unusual stuff. And serum GGT, a liver enzyme, should be below 35 aprox. Serum ferritin, the iron loading in the blood, should be below 200 maybe or below 300. It's variable. Cholesterol should be below 5 millimoles. So the doctor wasn't too happy uh, because I came in at 112 on the gamma glutamyl transferase, 530 in serum ferritin, which is the sixth marker for metabolic syndrome, I later learned, and 6.8 in cholesterol, which is not hypercholesterolemia per se, but very high for a doctor. So the first doc anyway was kind of not sure what to make of it particularly, but had some thoughts. I went to a second doctor, more senior, because I had sensed as a complex problem solving person that the expert was not overly sure. And again, I'm not criticizing, but I sensed that and got the same result. And then went to a very sen senior person, a professor of medicine to actually delve deeper. And essentially, Hemochromatosis was mentioned with the high ferritin. Eating more healthy whole grains and less fats was suggested for the cholesterol. The GGT, the question mark was around alcohol, but I didn't at the time really drink excessively. I was surprised at that, but it is true that GGT is, is a great marker for, for alcohol excess. But all in all, I got a genetic test for hemochromatosis. It was negative and things didn't add up. So basically, I kind of realized wow, the experts in any field will nearly always know uh, the two key questions on basic standard metrics. Uh, a, the implications of them, and that was very vague, and B, what you do to address them or resolve them, and that didn't really work out. So I thought, wow, that's amazing in a technical sphere, in this case medicine, again, not criticizing, but I knew instinctively when the experts kind of fail in basic stuff. To me, it appeared basic tests. There's something behind the scenes that can be found out. And I'm an expert problem solver in complex problems, so I said I'll go after it. So when the experts don't know, you go after the actual published science, not websites. Uh, I didn't even know at the time that there was a low carb movement as such, took no interest. And uh, I went straight to the published science through my corporate logon, full access on ResearchGate. And there were over 10,000 publications on serum ferritin, so I had plenty to start going through. Uh, there's around a billion on cholesterol, and a lot of them are misleading and biased, but we'll get into that later. Uh, and I researched it. Here's me in Singapore in 2013 on a business trip, and one of the engineers took a picture, and I'm actually having some delicious uh, crab. Uh, but the thing is, I was clearly overweight. I was also quite angry about the situation because I hadn't yet done the research. So it was root causing time. And as all my colleagues know over 20 years, when I get on that, uh, stuff tends to happen. So I went through masses of papers in the first few weeks. It became a kind of obsession, uh, which is also something I'm prone to occasionally. Uh, this is not my office, but I do have oh, nearly 3000 published papers on metabolic uh, science and trials on my hard drive and I've been through most of those and in great detail on around five or six hundred of them. So I did the work over the next years but in the first few weeks I go through what happened. I was on it. So what happened in the first few weeks was I realized there was a something called metabolic syndrome that was the biggest disease process in the world and I realized many things about the distraction of cholesterol and fat and all of those things had actually misled us from the genuine root causes and the top Pareto items. So I learned that what I was eating, which was medium fat protein, I didn't really try and go low fat. I did occasionally. I was having vegetable oils, heart healthy, and I did eat some junk food here and there for sure. I'll admit it. Uh, I was certainly eating excessive carbohydrate, I learned, healthy whole grains, massive piles of rice with dinners, quite a bit of fruit. Uh, which wouldn't have suited my physiology at the time, and pasta was healthy, whole grain when possible, yada yada, smoothies and stuff. I'll admit I was also high as fructose, chocolate and I, orange juice I liked, and it was my five a day, so I drank a lot of it, and that was a liver disaster, it turned out. 
Uh, so I was a bit, I was high on those kinds of things. So root cause solution was clear as day to me after four or five weeks of intense study. And I switched to a high healthy fat, moderate protein, possibly highish protein diet. You can see here what I switched to. It was the fatty fish for sure. Cheeses, meats, more fish, eggs, lots of eggs. Switched to double cream uh, in my coffee. And nuts are fine. Olives are a high fat natural food and coconut oils and all are healthy natural avocados, super high fat healthy food. Uh, back to butter, um, absolutely. And olive oil crushed from real fruit. Uh, vegetable oils banned because I began to discover vegetable oils were a major issue. And I had vegetables, they were fine. They were low sugar, non-starchy, unlike before. Uh, and I cut out the nonsense because I had realized sugar was the problem. Uh, before I had not seen an emphasis on that, I'd always seen an emphasis on fat. So what happened? Well, I switched to what turned out to be a low carb paleo type diet, though I wasn't aware at the time that this was a big movement. And again, a lot of high nutrient density ancestral evolutionary animal foods went into my diet uh, and plenty of vegetables too no problem there but the grains and all the carbohydrates uh, minimized what happened when you do this kind of intervention it was a single intervention i will stress i did not start loads of exercise and do other aspects of health i was ruthlessly focused on the metabolic processes and how i could target them with what i put in my mouth uh, exclusively so my GGT went from 112, um, by the way, undiagnosed type 2 diabetes is essentially what we're talking about here. Did the change, six weeks later got the bloods. So GGT effectively collapsed. Two weeks later I wanted to verify the trajectory and it had dropped further down into a reasonable range. The key thing is though the ferritin also collapsed. It is the sixth marker for metabolic syndrome after all. It's not too shocking. The cholesterol ratios became much, much better. Uh, not the total cholesterol, that went up a bit, but the really important ratios got way better, and I understood these now. The blood pressure collapsed from kind of hypertensive. I'd been told for years I should get antihypertensives. I didn't. It collapsed. And the key thing is it collapsed prior to weight loss. It dropped like a stone in the first week, 10 days. But the weight loss over the eight weeks did drop big time 95 kilos to 83 I looked completely different waist down to 32 first time in 20 something years so this dramatic transformation actually happens in my world quite a lot outside of health when you find a root cause a major root cause for a problematic system it often fixes many other things that you are not even targeting because the line quality surges so if you're going after cracking cases, you know, or dialyzers that are not transferring, you know, properly, uh, when you fix the core root cause, a lot of other quality issues get better. So that's what happened, and that shows when you get root cause. The other thing that happened, and one of the reasons for the weight loss was, and this was not predicted by me, my appetite control system became exquisite. And it was so shocking within the first few weeks I could skip meals with impunity and just keep working through. I, I was doing it casually as a hobby. And that did contribute to the weight loss, but it was via the mechanism of appetite control, which has massive scientific linkages into eating the wrong things. That disrupts your appetite control system through myriad pathways. So that made sense too later when I researched it. So how did the world abandon good science? Because I clearly discovered here that most of what we were told was misleading at best and fraudulent, I guess, at worst. How did that happen? Um, because the world should roughly come up with the right answers over decades of science. We look here at the journal American Cardiology and uh, in 2020 they came out, a reassessment right, for food-based recommendations, sat fats and health, and they basically said saturated fats from the science were never a problem once they're eaten in real food and not junk food, essentially. But in 17, we had the American Heart Association Presidential Advisory, and they basically told us saturated fat would kill us yesterday, and we should be drinking vegetable oils. I'm exaggerating, but they did, effectively. How could all of this nonsense be argued about up to 2020? Right? 
So we'll have to go through the fat fears briefly. And we all know this has been our running kind of joke for years. All focused on fat. You know, do you want that with or without angioplasty? Always on fat, the fatty breakfast, the fatty foods, rarely sugar. So Time Magazine 1961, this guy, a fish physiologist, um, Hansel Keys, front cover he gets on. He was very politically clever and very manipulative. And he was all talking about fat and heart disease. 1984 then, appropriately, we got this. A crappy drug trial to reduce cholesterol showed risibly weak results. But the front page of Time didn't talk about the drug trial but use the story to say eggs and bacon are a problem. And then in 2014, we have eat butter, science labeled fat the enemy, why they were wrong. So how the hell does the person in the street have a clue what's going on, right? And they don't. Just a word on keys. This was a six countries study. He selected six countries, um, carefully it would appear, and showed percentage calories for fat in these countries, higher deaths per 100. Okay then. What he didn't show was there were around 22 countries, right? and there was no correlation worth the toss. In fact, the Maasai and the Inuit would be out here at super high fat and super low deaths traditionally. So, why would he do that? I mean, it was the 70s. Was he smoking something? If he was, the rest of the world started smoking it on dietary stuff for the next 50 years. So it's a long, harsh story, but he did precipitate the beginnings of the descent into anti-science in the nutritional sphere. And a lot of work was done afterwards, much longer afterwards to maintain that because it became commercially an imperative uh, to stick with these theories because the whole food industry became based on these theories and the cheap ingredients they were now asked to put in foods to help with health. It wasn't a corporate corruption from the start. It just became one. So if we look at the actual data at a glance for Europe, saturated fat percentage of energy across Europe, a strong linear kind of reduction in death rate per thousand with higher saturated fat percentage. Okay, it's a correlation, but come on. Uh, for females, I think this is uh, an even stronger correlation. So that's just a correlation. But if you look at Ansel Key's biggest work, right, in his legacy, it was 1970s, remember. He did the seven country study, only seven countries, men only, 12,000 men, cherry picked countries, of course, and manual analysis, right, back of a fag packet, and came out with this stuff that fat is bad, drives up cholesterol, causes heart disease, yada yada. The Pure study came out in 17, right? Modern technology, 180,000 people analyzed over 18 countries with an unbiased team of professors from around the world. Modern technology and statistical analysis and deconfounding. And they found higher saturated fat percentage in the diet, generally lower cardiovascular disease and lower mortality. And they tried to deconfound for societal advancement and the other factors that could confound. But either way, you can see a dramatic reversal of this guy's nonsense. So you can essentially, on principle, throw that in the trash from the get-go. People try and defend them. Industry tries and defends them. It's unsustainable. It's absurd. So a little jewel I found back a while ago, heart disease and stroke statistics from Circulation, the premier journal of heart disease. And it was a 100-page detailed document that probably no one really read, but I did. And on page 50-odd, they had interesting stuff. They went on the record and said the truth. None of this went into press releases, and no one would have known. But what they had in there, the Women's Health Randomized Clinical Trial, 50,000 women, reduction of total fat from 37% to 24-odd, had no effect on the incidence of coronary heart disease, stroke, or total coronary vascular disease. Now, this is a clinical trial. This is not associational. This was consistent with null results of four prior randomized clinical trials and multiple large prospective cohort studies. They buried that in page 50-something. Okay, So they got on the record. I thought that was pretty sly. They also went through the prospective cohort studies, associational, 
all around the world, nearly half a million participants, each 5% higher energy consumption of carbohydrate in place of saturated fat was associated with a 7% higher risk of coronary heart disease. None of this ever hit the press. It was quietly logged in the middle of the document. So there you go. We won't talk about conspiracy. Killer cholesterol. The reason the fat was meant to be bad was because it raised the killer cholesterol. And that's kind of a joke too, right? Because cholesterol is the most important molecule in our bodies. Our liver makes most of our cholesterol for a reason. Good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. How absurd in principle is that when your body makes most of it? Okay, we'll get into that. So I gave a talk, Cholesterol Conundrum, which anyone who's interested, it was back in 2013. Uh, it stands to this day. I was amazed when I revisited it a few months ago and I wouldn't actually change anything in it. And it was the product of massive intense research into the cholesterol metabolic pathways. And it really should give a great insight into how the body actually works. Uh, I went through HDL, reverse cholesterol transport, and all of the technology uh, to a quite advanced level, but tried to translate it for technical lay people. I went through the uh, lipoprotein particles and explained how they all were and how they worked and the different types, including LDL, our old friend. And I'm just going to go through briefly the LDL species here in a little detail. It's created by your liver for triglyceride and cholesterol delivery, right? But mainly energy delivery in general. VLDL, IDL, and LDL. So here's your liver, plenty of receptors for LDL, uh, takes back cholesterol that's gone through the chain and recycles it. Nature never wastes. We start off with your liver making very low density lipoprotein and it's low density because it's, it's bigger, more volume per, per weight. And there's a lot of ligand here to link into your body's uh, receptor systems. So first thing is these boats, think of them as submarines or boats. Uh, they're actually fat based, but they're held in a hydrophilic shell. So they get to go through, through your hydrophilic blood where normally fatty things would float like blobs. Very clever trick by nature, but the stuff is safe in the hole. So it visits muscle and uh, with C2, lipoprotein lipase, uh, it docks the boat, opens the hole, takes out the triglyceride into muscle for healthy energy, fat-based energy to drive your body. And also if you're not driving your body enough, by all means, uh, same mechanism, fat cells will store this juicy energy for later use or when you need it. So that's perfect, all good. Uh, yeah, again, receptors. The particle becomes smaller and becomes an intermediate density lipoprotein then, and it loses the C2. So this is all part of an exquisite system, but keeps flowing and delivering. And it delivers through hepatic lipase. Same kind of thing, muscle and fat, different mechanism. So it's kind of taking out more of the triglyceride. And finally, we end up with an LDL, a low-density lipoprotein. And it's lost the E now, and just B100, the protein of the particle, remains. Uh, so this is LDL, perfectly designed by evolution, perfectly benign. Okay, the one, the bad cholesterol. This delivers cholesterol to tissues and cells that can't make their own. Very few, the gonads and a, a couple of others. Most cells, because cholesterol is so crucial, most cells can create their own cholesterol. But there are some exceptions that LDL uh, services. There's a moderate uptake time to the liver, right? Many receptor systems, uh, but it's left out there for quite a while to do its work. And uh, around two days residence time. Receptors there whip it up in a healthy body. Now, if you have hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, or many other metabolic issues, you will cause a problem with your LDL cholesterol. You get oxidized cholesterol, you get small dense phenotype. And hepatic lipase is, is elevated there when it really oughtn't be. That's not the body's fault. That's the fault of what you did, mostly what you put in your mouth. And there's a poor uptake residence time here. It differs between studies, but the particles become more ovoid and do not fit receptors as well. So they actually stay longer in the blood to be oxidized more. Okay, or if you're hyperglycemic to be damaged by that sugar even more. So it's kind of an accelerator. And by all means, these damaged, compromised cholesterol particles, right? Not their fault, 
but they've been compromised, they do partake by all means in atherosclerotic plaque as part of the components in there and macrophage foam cells that are our heart disease problem. So there is a connection, but it ain't what they generally infer. Hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, I'm going to overemphasize today. It's not the only problem, but it's the elephant in the room. So I'm going to keep popping this up. That's what throws the whole exquisite process into utter dysfunction. Okay, but no one talked about that the last 50 years. Not really. Undiagnosed type 2 diabetes is what this is. It doesn't matter whether you're diagnosed or not. You're type 2 diabetic if you're hyperinsulinemic, right? Period. So, longest running heart study. What did it say about cholesterol, really? What didn't get in the papers, but what was important? So, William P. Castelli, one of the original directors, a cardiologist and data expert, said, unless LDL levels are very high, 7.8 millimoles or higher. Now, that's the LDL alone. So you'd be carrying the total cholesterol probably over 10. They have no value in isolation in predicting those individuals at risk of coronary heart disease. Wow. The total over HDL ratio was found to be a better predictor of coronary heart disease than total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglyceride, not only in Framingham, but also in Physicians Health Study and many other studies. And it has not changed to this day. No one listened to Castelli because the message was, a little complicated and it kind of said LDL ain't the picture and at this stage an LDL industry was building and it wasn't going to happen. Just briefly, insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, right, the metabolic dysfunction, drives cardiovascular disease like nothing else. And I'll show you that in a minute. It also drives lower HDL cholesterol and increased small dense LDL phenotype. So it gifts the cholesterol system with a correlation to cardiovascular disease. But this is the root causer's path, the top Pareto, and this is the obfuscator's path. Okay. Illustration. Not from me, from the world's top risk algorithms developed over decades by the experts. Okay. 50-year-old male, cholesterol around 8 millimoles. LDL around five or more millimoles. And this is Irish audience, so we, we won't do milligrams per deciliter. This is what you're familiar with. Doctor would literally get a shock with that kind of cholesterol. The most doctors would. Let's be fair about it. However, what if the person is not insulin resistant? What does this mean? Well, if you put in a person and choose the numbers in the algorithm, to make the person not insulin resistant, low blood pressure and several other things, no diabetes. This person comes out with low risk. 5% or lower is no medication, it's low risk, okay? And if the person, and there's many people out there with high cholesterol who get a coronary calcium scan, which is the ultimate test for your degree of coronary disease, and gets a zero, which many of them will, a lot of them are on statins, but many of them will get a zero score, and in the algorithms that use coronary score, the person would come out as ultra low risk. I mean, this is the lowest risk you can possibly be. And this is a 50 year old male. Look at that, 0.9, that's effectively zero risk, okay, for someone middle aged. The key is if he's not insulin resistant, the algorithms all say he's fine. How many people out there and how many doctors know this? I'll tell you. Most doctors would have no clue of what I just told you, in spite of its profound, profound nature. Uh, they won't know, and I know because I've been to many of them. If you don't measure it, you can't understand it. If you don't measure it, it don't get fixed. And that's what we say in complex problem solving. Okay? So I'll show you a little bit of measuring that was proper measuring. This study with people who had a first heart attack, men, they looked and over seven years they tracked them to see well who gets a second heart attack and they got their bloods at the start to see well what's important so this is a lovely study perspective the total cholesterol and LDL bad cholesterol levels of these guys had no predictive power over the next seven years right non-significant didn't even show up high blood pressure doubled the risk for a second heart attack and that's high blood pressure is a pretty good metric we all know that it's a good risk factor high insulin usually they never measure this 
nearly seven times the risk of a second heart attack if you had high insulin. Right? So this was the granddaddy, obviously. And the ironic thing is most idiopathic uh, or essential hypertension that you don't know the cause, but you got it, most of it's due to hyperinsulinemia in any case. So it's kind of a proxy. So you can see where insulin figures here when you actually look properly at the data. Undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. 2015 Eurospar study. Here again, uh, you know, they measured the right stuff. They focused in on dysglycemia in patients with coronary artery disease. Okay, and they used lots of measures of glucose imbalance and they had a good look. They surveyed all coronary disease uh, patients across Europe. Uh, well, not all, but a sample representative. Ages represented 18 to 80. It wasn't biased. And 24 European countries. So they did what an engineer would do. Let's look at all of the problem in all categories across all regions and look and see what shows up. Well, here's what showed up. Straight away on their record, uh, around a third were, were type 2 diabetics already. And that'll tell you something, right? When they looked closely at the bloods, there were another quarter that were actually type 2 diabetic full-blown but had not been diagnosed. They called the other quarter who had high glucose issues, um, I think it was high risk for type 2 diabetes, but they were diabetic. If it shows up in your glucose, you're diabetic. And they didn't insulin test here, sadly. And if they had it, because you must measure insulin to diagnose type 2 diabetes properly. If they had measured it, myself and my co-author, Dr. Gerber, reckon maybe half the remainder would be essentially type 2 diabetic. Imagine that. If you don't measure it, you can't understand it. Euroaspire was a groundbreaking study that no one really covered. Most overwhelmingly of heart disease patients in Europe are essentially type 2 diabetic. So that'll tell you. Undiagnosed in most cases. The TOFI thin outside fat inside epidemic. This is enormous. We basically, in a scan, you see a person who has a good BMI can have this internal fat in a CT scan. And that's the, you know, organ fat, uh, it's the visceral fat, many names. Uh, but this is a major problem, and it's kind of invisible from the outside. 40% approximately of non-obese are TOFI, right? Hence an epidemic. TOFI heart attack risk, if you measure properly, it's kind of up there with the obese, only people aren't really looking. So if someone gets a heart attack and they're obese or they smoke, you say, ah, you know. What about the guy who's in his 50s who's not really overweight very strongly and does not smoke? All those tragedies, or women indeed, um, chances are they're toffee. If you don't measure it though, you can't understand it. Undiagnosed type 2 diabetes. These are the primary drivers of cardiac disease and a lot of chronic disease. The reason cholesterol doesn't get on there is not because it's irrelevant, it's because it can't make the list. It's a proxy primarily. Hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, high blood glucose and spikes following meals is the biggie, uh, but there are lots of other we won't get into today. But this is the list if you go through all the literature. Undiagnosed diabetes is the top of the list. It's not the only cause. Sometimes uh, zealots uh, in insulin resistance get accused of giving it all the credit. Uh, it's just the big one, and we always need to focus on the big one. Modern processed foods and lifestyles are the drivers. No stranger to you guys, that one. So Western white men here, just to illustrate, I'm showing calcification for the percentiles of the population in calcification, and we've got the age groups. So you can see that basically, once you get older, the highest calcified people, you have enormous calcification scores, up to like 5,000, right? Anything over zero is a risk. If you get up to the hundreds and thousands, you could have 25 times the risk for your age bracket of a heart attack in the next 10 years. That's how big a risk factor calcification is. Look at the West. Now I'm going to show you an indigenous population. And the results are the same for all of them once they're living traditional lifestyle and nutrition. Here's the Semaine men, right? Same age groups, percentiles, practically no calcification. 
practically no heart disease. Now, I guess these guys have lower cholesterol, right? Gotta be. No, remember our list? These guys do not have what's on this list. In fact, their cholesterol particle counts of LDL are the same or higher in some cases than the West. But they don't have these because these are the root causes. They're missing them. Especially this one. Their insulin's in their boots and their glucose. If you Google insulin resistance, uh, this is an old slide, don't need to tell you guys. And the disease of your choice, modern chronic disease, the, the major cancers, solid tumor cancers, cardiac disease, uh, Alzheimer's, which is type 3 diabetes, yada yada. You're going to get a million papers. The elephant in the room. 64% of US adults over 45 are now pre-diabetic or diabetic. I ain't saying that, right? It's the census. That's just the base figures. If you included insulin testing, you could put that up to 75%. So the biggest driver of heart disease in the world, or in the West, 75% of your people over 45 have it. And we all scratch our heads and wonder about why heart disease is high. It's almost comical. They're all essentially diabetic. Pre-diabetic diabetic is just taking the mickey. It's obfuscation. They've got diabetic physiology. That's the problem to fix. Ireland's behind that, but not by a million miles. So, a soup song of the science. Use some nice words I like here. A tiny slice of science. We don't have huge time. This paper was great from Professor Volokh. Impact of restricting dietary fat versus carbohydrate on risk factors. LDL, the reason for low-fat diets, is to reduce LDL. That's the only reason, really. Does that address the root causes from the science, the big ones? No. That's the fundamental problem with low fat. It never addressed the problem. However, if we list out the really important measures, and I touched on some of them before, I won't go into detail, the real measures of future disease, and we look at keto low-carb studies, many, many of them, they address them almost exclusively, overwhelmingly. They address the root causes. That's why they're very effective. Verta in the US, a big uh, startup, they did a trial for a year with type 2 diabetics. You can look at the numbers. All they implemented was advice, support, and a low carb keto, very low carb diet. They didn't get into a lot of other stuff. 94% decreased or eliminate their insulin, 60% regressed their type 2 diabetes which in medical orthodoxy is impossible. Type 2 diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. It will always grow worse over time and you will need more medications. That is medical dogma. Over half reversed in one year with just diet. Okay. Uh, Redicare in Ireland I'm working with have done the same thing. Two small trials, they got between 50 something and 70% regression in three months. Remission from type 2 diabetes, just with food. Low carb food, but just food. That's addressing root cause. This one here I loved. Smallish study, uh, Professor Volokh again with military, and he implemented a keto diet and support with recipes, etc. But it was a single intervention, and the people went with it and stuck to it. 18 pounds down relatively for the people uh, in the intervention arm, body fat 5% down, visceral fat down 43%. Insulin resistance down 30%, right? This, again, was the three-month study. Very well executed. It's addressing the root causes. This guy, APOE4, is just one I like, even though it's a case history type study. Insulin resistant dyslipidemia, bad cholesterol ratios, brain fog, Alzheimer's type uh, problems, and he's susceptible genetically. They give him a keto diet, as we said, uh, for just a few months. His insulin measures went down around 90%. His triglyceride over HDL, one of the best measures of risk from the cholesterol metrics, over 50% reduced. His HbA1c, blood glucose level, long term, dropped 30%, which is enormous, obviously, and he became technically non-diabetic, uh, like I mentioned a few minutes ago. And his MOCA cognitive score, which usually always goes down, it actually went up 26%, and that's a 
established tests they use for mental clarity in Alzheimer's and other settings. So this is it. And this is the tip of the iceberg, a soup song of the science out there. But I'm not sure nutritional schools focus in as much on this science. Uh, I, I don't think they do. So addressing the root cause. In simplest form, I use this for lay people. Sorry, guys, but I just use it to, to make it simple. Ultra processed foods are made up with the devil's triad. And the devil's triad are sugars, obviously, refined grains and refined carbohydrates, and uh, seed oils, industrially extracted seeds, uh, oils, which have a series of problems. 60% of the UK diet is now from ultra processed foods by calories, and they have the devil's triad. It makes up nearly the whole bulk of them because the materials are ultra cheap and the world believes that vegetable oils, which cost a penny a pound, you know, believes that they're actually good. But either way, you eliminate these. And if you do that and nothing else, you know, you're going to be 90 times ahead of your, your fellow persons. You replace them, of course, with real food, right? This will often be high fat. It can be vegetables. It can be fish, of course. But the real foods, the ancestral human evolutionary foods, you simply backfill with those real foods, as I showed you I did. It's not too complex. You stop fearing the fat and you focus on lowering the refined carbohydrate sugars, etc., and then the fat's no problem. And these are nutrient dense foods. Eggs are superfoods. I mean, beyond belief. Organ meats, similarly. Uh, and if you're going to eat fruit, if you're not diabetic and you're very healthy and low insulin resistance, you can get away with a lot of fruit, even though modern fruits are bred for sugar for the last hundred years. Uh, you can get away with them. But anyone who has any hint of metabolic syndrome, berry fruits, don't go overboard uh, for obvious reasons. Exercise, fantastic, but many people won't really do it. So it's easier to actually fix your diet lifestyle. And then potassium and magnesium and EPA, DHA, there's obviously a lot of really important vitamins and minerals you can boost up on without going down the whole nutraceutical route. Uh, there's a lot of things modern foods do not have nearly as high a percentage as they used to even three or four decades ago. Uh, the magnesium content of vegetables in the USDA has dropped, I think, around 80% over three decades. So you got to be realistic too with modern foods. So that kind of is the whirlwind tour. And um, I think I'm not far off the 40 minutes. Uh, the book uh, has done extremely well, which I didn't expect, but I'm delighted with it. Amazon is 4.8 or something stars from our over a thousand reviews, uh, not just my pals. And, um, you know, we've put all of what I said today in and, and a massive amount more, obviously, uh, to kind of get a time capsule of everything you need to know and thankfully the book went out I think it was finished in 17 but I reviewed it again a few months ago like my cholesterol lecture and I was delighted to see I went through it a bit paranoid um, no wouldn't change a thing I think it's essentially timeless um, so that's kind of pleasing too anyway sorry about the last bit it sounds a bit arrogant but there you go okay I will unshare well, there it is. We moved on to Q&A session. So the first question was around the fascinating link between serum ferritin and metabolic syndrome. Uh, just teasing that out a little more. And here's my answer. Absolutely. So there's, I have a little funny story about that. I ran out of my sitting room. I, all, I remember it always. And it was in 2000, I think 12. I put 13 when I did this, but it was really late 12. And uh, I ran out of the room basically shouting like Eureka moment. My wife was wondering what the hell for the last few weeks I'm around the clock evenings and weekends buried in this. And she's thinking, well, look, it's interesting and it's important, but what's going on? Uh, I ran out. And the reason I ran out is because I knew from my research to date that serum ferritin must be a marker for metabolic syndrome because I'd gone deep down the iron dysregulation uh, path. But I couldn't find anywhere anyone acknowledging this. Um, so I was looking for, has anyone not acknowledged this? And I found it. I found, I think it was a Chinese or Asian paper. And it was actually titled, uh, proposing that serum ferritin become the sixth marker for metabolic syndrome. Mm. That was actually the title. 
and I ran through it and of course I speed read it because I knew everything in it but yeah they had it and I found more afterwards but it's not well known uh, it does not have to be we have people in their 60s with zero calcification uh, with very high ferritin 600 so it looks like genetically you may run like lp little a lipoprotein a you may genetically run a high ferritin the storage molecule for iron uh, benignly but in general it's a great indicator or marker or proxy uh, for metabolic dysregulation the second question was then about hemochromatosis, the iron loading disease that the Irish are three times afflicted by more so than uh, the rest of the population. Uh, so I clarified that. Well, there, there, there is connection obviously between all the systems of iron regulation, but, but hemochromatosis uh, is genuinely high iron because, and it's an interesting one too, we have more of a genetic heritage of maybe a lack of iron and a lack of nutrition and many of us have developed hyperabsorption of iron from the gut and the problem actually is a genetic predisposition to hyperabsorb iron so you really end up with iron overload and it's kind of somewhat independent of the metabolic iron regulation that flags uh, metabolic syndrome they're connected but not so much but you know one intriguing thing is regardless giving blood is great for the community and giving blood drops your iron levels rapidly, relatively rapidly, hence the hemochromatosis guys, their problem is fixed just from giving blood. Mm -hmm. um, you can do it four times a year, you're helping the community, and you will drop your iron levels, um, and that is no harm at all. Though, got to be careful, uh, low iron is kind of an epidemic as well, particularly in women pre-menopause. Uh, Mm -hmm. So that's an enormous problem too. So you just got to be careful not, not to view it too simplistically. The third question was on CAC, coronary calcification scan availability in Ireland. Uh, so here's my answer. Yeah, you do need a referral from a GP and the vast majority of GPs will just say, no, I think that one's useless. And the reason they did, sadly, is a little bit of a conspiracy. I can send a movie uh, which goes through why it happened. But the coronary calcium scan became a major problem for the medical business. So I'll give you a few examples. The Mayo Clinic back in the 80s, I think, they did a study and found out if we actually scan people, middle-aged people, around a half of them will get a zero. And that means they don't need to go in for an invasive angiogram because their risk is through the floor. And the hospital management, and that, that's a big, big outfit, uh, they squashed the project because 30% of their revenue came from invasive angiograms, the cat lab. Yeah. So they realized there's no way we can, we can let this proliferate. <laughs> it's obviously corrupt, but it's business. Uh, I've got 10 more reasons, but coronary calcium scan is the most incredibly effective and useful heart test you can do by a mile. The radiation is trivial, but no one wants to do it for myriad reasons. But you can get it with a doctor's note, and in Ireland, it's around 300 bucks, and now insurance will often cover it. And uh, you just need to find a doctor who actually understands the science. Uh, we have one in NACE, actually, and he does remote um, consultations and can arrange them. Um, and ikaria.ie, I-K-A-R-I-A.ie is his website. So that'll give you no hassle introduction to CAC. The fourth question was that old chestnut, fiber, benefits of fiber. What were my views? Well, here they are. Yeah, fiber. Fiber's interesting. So I don't like to knock fiber. I think it's been massively overemphasized in the scheme of what's important, but I won't knock it. Some people in my world do kind of knock it. So the problem with the modern foods is that you've broken the mechanical structure of the food. So fiber is important because it's part of real food that slows glucose absorption and insulin release uh, through GIP hormone in the gut, etc. Lots going on there. So it's important that real food re retains its mechanical structure and, and fiber is part of that, absolutely. That's the way I view fiber, eat real vegetables, eat real food. However, putting fiber back into smashed food and being able to claim high fiber, like with cereals and all this junk, that's the danger. 
So simply putting fiber in and having fiber is not the advantage. Retaining the structure of real food is the crucial thing. So that's the way I kind of tell people, eat real food and real vegetables, you'll get your fiber. Varying amounts of people believe in its importance, but do it with real food. But be very careful about anything that claims fiber on the pack, right? A broccoli doesn't have, I'm high fiber written onto its stem, right? Anything that claims high fiber and it's man-made produced food or person-made, um, that's the problem. And the industry, the food industry has absolutely game this one you know as you're probably aware fifth question was on the cholesterol conundrum video and yes it's still available i give the details here but searching for either cholesterol conundrum in youtube or even google i'd say would get you to it yeah it's actually i was pleasantly it was at a hundred thousand views i'd know a year or two ago but i mm -hmm. moved into into new stuff, lost track of it. Uh, but I just checked today and it's 200,000. So yeah, it's on YouTube and um, absolutely. And it goes into great detail on what I touched on. And But guys like you would be fascinated. In fairness, it's probably a little heavy for lay people, but, but yeah, it's there. And we had a huge Q&A, nearly an hour at the end. And a load of those questions are probably ones that, that could come up here. Next question was around finding me and my stuff on nutrition and metabolic health. Uh, so I clarified that and just mentioned how to find my nutrition and health material as opposed to my significant amount of coronavirus material. I'll just mention one thing. Googling Ivor Cummins is usually better. Uh, I, well, it, it gets you straight to my YouTube. And right. I will say... I have been the last year and a half involved somewhat with a large group of Irish and international doctors and professors on the Corona um, issue. And some of it is controversial, but you'll hit on a lot of Corona stuff uh, if you Google me now, but be it as it may. But if you do Ivor Cummins cholesterol, Ivor Cummins nutrition, Ivor Cummins CAC, that'll keep you out of the Corona wars. I was finally asked about uh, coronavirus and all the focus on masks and lockdowns with highly questionable science behind them that were leveraged from China Communist Party originally. Uh, would it not have been better to focus on nutrition and immune system health and vitamin D and other things like that? Uh, so I answered that. Yeah, I last April 2020. I did my first uh, YouTubes on vitamin D and they're still there. Uh, some stuff YouTube took down because it didn't fit the narrative, but they're still there. And uh, the fact is the FDA in June 2020 put in injunctions against natural health, health websites for discussing vitamin D and Corona. And the bottom line is if you have a vitamin D level, blood level, and it's not based on supplements. It was shown last summer 2020 that a vitamin D level above 32 nanogram, nanomol, nanogram, and certainly in the 40s where it should be, that I recommend, blood level, uh, your risk for serious illness or death was 10 plus times lower. I mean, it was order of magnitude lower. It came up in many studies. So it's probably the most important thing of all. If your vitamin D is in the 40s, you can almost forget about worrying about coronavirus, um, essentially. Did you hear that in the media? No, you heard the opposite. <laughs> Loads of articles came out challenging that vitamin D was even relevant. And the same applies to diet. Remember back in March, April, it came out in the media. Um, you can't boost your immune system. Well... I put out a interview with Dr. Ron Rosedale, who is at the genius level. He discovered 30 years ago the importance of insulin, essentially, in metabolic disease. I interviewed him in India, April 2020. And that's a fantastic interview to watch. And basically, he went through the basic science. Leptin and hyperinsulinemia is hyperleptinemia, a crucial hormone. Leptin is a cytokine. It's involved intimately in the immune system just went through the mechanisms. If you're metabolically dysregulated, and we see enormously higher risk for diabetic people, overweight people, hell in March 2020 from China, it came out a 10X risk factor for age, insulin resistance, blah, 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 COPD, uh -huh. insulin resistance, diabetic, heart disease patients. I mean, we had the answer in March 2020 of who was vulnerable, um, but basically it, it just never got traction. And I think the world, 
decided and the WHO said and all the authorities said from the start we don't have treatments um, diet and all and vitamin D don't go there and we hunker down and we wait for the vaccine I mean <laughs> that was the strategy <laughs> so what can I say no conspiracy theories it was just the most absurd strategy in the universe to someone like me who understands this so there you go and there you go job done another talk another q a another set of nutrition students becoming more aware of what's really going on in the world of metabolic disease so please hold on for my kind of outro really appreciate the support i've been getting so far to do this and myriad other things uh, to help with population health so great if you can take a look at this don't forget to subscribe and also to hit that little bell icon to make sure you're informed and get to counter some of the more corporate style science that's out there. So all the links are in the description box below and also really appreciate all my PayPal and Patreon supporters and anyone else who can continue to support me to provide all the material that I do. It's highly appreciated. So thank you.